as the discussant and chief guest of the evening. I request you, sir, to please come on the dais and take your seat. Sir. Dr. Subhash Sharma is an IS officer of 1984 batch. He is a renowned writer of Hindi poetry, prose, and short stories. His famous works include an anthology of poems, namely, Sindhagi Ka Gadde, Angare Par Baitha Admi, and Ham Bharat Ke Log, and a collection of short stories, namely, Dush Chakra, Bezuba, and Book, and many others. His Hindi book, Bharat Me Manwadikar, is very popular. He has delivered many public lectures on human rights, gender, child labor, and environment at UNICEF Patna. Dr. Sharma was awarded with the, Bharat, with the Bihar Rashtra Bhasha Parishad Award for his literary works. We welcome you, sir. We are also glad to have with us an esteemed personality as a guest of honor, Professor Daisy Narayan, presently the head of postgraduate department of history, Patna University, and president of People's Union for Civil Liberties. I request you, ma'am, to come on the days and take your seat. <laughs> Professor Daisy is a multi-talented and multi-faceted personality, teaching since 1980, first in Patna Women's College, and then the postgraduate department of Reed Level. She has presented papers at many national and international seminars and co-authored and edited a number of books. She has written articles on many subjects, including ancient and modern Indian history, education, human rights, environment education, child and women rights. Professor Daisy Narayan is also a member of several government bodies like Member Management Committee, Ministry of Women and Child Development, and civil society organizations. We are honored to have you with us, ma'am. I would like to extend my warm welcome to our special guest, Dr. Anita Ambast, Associate Professor, Department of Ophthalmology, Indira Gandhi Institute of Medical Sciences, Patna. She is an alumna of Patna Medical College and Hospital, Patna, and Rachi Medical College and Hospital, Rachi. She has served as the President of Rotary Patna Shakti and has won many awards for public service from the district. I request you, ma'am, to please come on the days. I would like to request Dr. Shankar Edad, Professor and Head of Department of English, Patna University, to come on the days and take his seat. Dr. Shankar Edad is the former chairman of Bihar Sangeet Natak Academy and the former principal College of Arts and Craft, Patna University, Patna. He has been honored with a number of awards, including the Best Teacher Award by Patna University and Rotary Lions Club Award for his teachings, research, and citizenship. We welcome you, sir. We are glad to have with us Father Dr. T. Nishant S.J the principal of St. Xavier's College and St. Xavier's College of Management and Technology, Patna, and the chief organizer of the seminar. His research was on the Muslims, cultural life of the Dalit community in Bihar. He received his postgraduate degree in advanced sociology from Delhi University and graduated from Madras University. He started his professional career in 1988 as a teacher in Ara Catholic High School Vice Principal of Xavier Training, Teacher Training Institute, Patna, Principal at Xavier Jesuit Training Institute, Bangalore, and Assistant Director at Manthan Social Training Center, Patna, Vice Principal of St. Xavier's College, Patna, are other positions that he has graced. He has attended various conferences and conducted workshops. Father Dr. T. Nishan S.J. is a member of the admission committee and grievances cell of Arabhat Knowledge University, Patna. His current academic involvement is in publishing a book on the life, on the cultural life of the Muslims in Bihar. Father, I now request you to formally welcome everyone and address all present here. Knowledge Society for Sustainable Development is a result of a two-day national seminar 
organized by St. Xavier's College and St. Xavier's College of Management and Technology on the 11th and 12th of April 2015. It is well said, knowledge is power. And we have seen through the ages how the privileged few have had control over knowledge and how they governed knowledge resources and hence profited immensely. India produced a few great scholars and sages over the years, yet large segment of society remained illiterate and ignorant for centuries. Knowledge and knowledge resources are still not accessible to a substantial segment of our society. And it is here that the book asks why it has been so. It raises the voice of the unheard and the marginalized and valorizes issues related to the rights of those left far behind. Besides, it questions the whole idea of development which is essentially lopsided and provides ways in which knowledge and knowledge resources can be liberated and help establish knowledge society which channelizes development and thereby assures its efficaciousness and sustainability. Our chief guest and the main discussant, Dr. Subhash Chamayes, has done his Master's in Sociology from JNU Delhi and Doctorate from Patna University. He has a number of books to his credit and some of them are Bharat Me Manavadhikar, Human Rights, Text and Context, Developments and its Discordance, etc. We are extremely happy to have you amidst us and may I request Dr. Muni Basami, a renowned scholar and an esteemed academician, to offer a floral bouquet and present a memento to him. Department of History, Patna University, is the President of People's Union for Civil Liberties. Professor Desi is a member of several government bodies like Member Management Committee, CARA, Ministry of Women and Child Development, etc. She is also a member of several societies and civil society organizations, including East and West Education Society. May I request Ms. Nirdha Lal, Department of Coordinator of Department of Mass Communication, St. Xavier's College of Management and Technology. Thank you, Nirjama. Our special guest, Dr. Anita Ambastra, Associate Professor, Department of Ophthalmology, IGMS Patna, has been a part of National Rapid Assessment of our Avoidable Blindness Survey with the National Program for Control of Blindness and RP Center Ames, New Delhi. And I request Father Alphonse Krasta, yes. We are really happy to have amidst us Dr. Shailesh. We are also happy to have Dr. Muniba Sami former lecturer in English Department, Patna University, and former IQAC coordinator of St. Xavier's Colleges, Patna. May I request Father Raj Kumar, the administrator. I warmly welcome all our distinguished guests, staff members, and students. Lectures, film criticism, and contemporary literary theory. His dissertation, A Post Colonial Studies of Politics, Identity, and Culture in Select Indian Nonfiction, is well known. I would now like to invite Dr. Anurag Ambas to give a brief introduction of the book. Sir? 
जो मैं डरी हो ना इमोशन हो गया आप कैसे खाते हैं मुझे बता एक बार दिखा दीजिए जानी सरकार डॉक्टर सत्येंद्र प्रसाद डॉक्टर मुदिता मैनोना सदौर डॉक्टर सुशील बेलू डॉक्टर सुशील कुमार सिंह डॉक्टर इमिसाद इमाम वैद्य सेवानंद मेलुखुलन मिसेस कल्पना कुमारी डॉक्टर पी एम एंथनी मिसेस अर्चना झा डॉक्टर रेमन डॉक्टर असलम परवेज डॉक्टर रुनू रावी सिस्टर एम स्तुति एंड मिसेस जोयता दास Ladies and gentlemen, this book is an impressive collection of scholarly articles that expresses the intersections of inequality. This book refines the profitability and the gain of the exponential growth of information and communication technology and the economic upsurge of the post-capitalist corporate consortium in the formation of qualitative social order. For grounding the importance of eco-critic social milieu, the papers talk about knowledge which celebrates pluralities and which believes in inclusivist philosophy. Thank you one and all present here for investing your precious time and making this event worthwhile. I will now hand this discussion to my professor, Dr. Shankar Da, Depart Head, Department of English, Patna University, Patna, and the former chairman of Bihar Sanghi Natak Academy and former principal of Patna Arts and Craft College, sir. <coughs> at the release of a book that deals with the idea of a knowledge society for sustainable development. Professor Daisy Narayan, Head Department of History, is somebody whose knowledge quotient is very well known in the city and I have the suspicion that she can talk on anything in the world. Uh, we have Dr. Anita Ambash, Father Nishant's principal, <coughs> who produces knowledge? For whom is knowledge produced? And who are the beneficiaries of the production of knowledge? There has always been a knowledge society that has existed. Initially, in very communal terms, communities of people who gathered together around somebody who was very wise. For example, Socrates. And, and we also know what happened to Ecolathia. Digital subtraction forms of direct intervention through violence has always been associated with forms of knowledge other than the dominant ones. So people who have always thought similarly have enabled the world to remain within the diversity, to equal access to education, three, universal access to information in the public domain, and four, freedom of expression. If we put all these parameters together, what do you think is the ability in India to create knowledge? 
It is a question that we need to answer. Cultural diversity has always existed and so has a shared history. But we would observe that there is a new dominant mode of thought which tries... It does not exist. Three, universal access to information in the public domain. What kind of information is available in the public domain to create that kind of knowledge that will set people free, that will increase the happiness quotient, that is going to actually create a kind of an environment where increased productivity will go hand in hand with the very idea of freedom. These are things that one needs to focus upon. As far as freedom of expression is concerned, you know better. Right. One of the biggest issues when I talked about Marx is associated with the fact that the Marx Marxists, namely those that belong to the Frankfurt School, they were completely against the idea of free of cost. Now where does the problem lie? Largely on two counts. One is that we've been subjected through the process of colonialism, which has buried indigenous knowledge systems. A simple example that I would like to cite is from agriculture. There's a friend of mine who retired as a very senior civil servant and he's one of those people who decided not to settle down in the comforts of a metropolitan location. He decided to go back to his village where he's contributing to both the productive life as well as trying to see how he can get people involved in productive work as, as well. Now he decided many, many years ago, if I remember, it was the mid-90s, to set up an orchard. And he was told that the mango saplings had to be planted in and in, in around July. But, what, and the reason was that there is a lot of rainfall at that particular point in time. But that year, after he had planted his mango saplings, the rains failed. And when the rains failed, he had to hire labor very extensively in order to plant all those mango saplings, which meant gender for the privileged. I'm sorry to quote these figures again. And India ranks at hundred and in the 140th position among 156 countries. And it has dropped seven positions further than last year. This is the ground situation. So when we talk in terms of knowledge society, we got to see who produces the knowledge. Are university sources of production of knowledge? <coughs> it brings a smile to my face because we don't produce knowledge. We merely reproduce things that have been repeated into our years for generations. Why don't we produce knowledge? Recently, you must have read in the newspapers that the Central University of Kerala has, in all its wisdom, the Vice-Chancellor set out, gave out a directive that said that Research will now only be conducted in areas of national priorities. This was, this was as a result of a Vice Chancellor's conference that had taken place in Delhi not so long ago. So who is to decide what these national priorities are? Does, let us say, sustainable development have anything to do with national priorities? I'm afraid not. The national priorities are all related to profit making for a few. And <laughs> My grandma's wife has been trying to pass her Bihar board exams for the last three years. We finally get a teacher even after I failed to get her passed, you know, from my teaching. It was not that good. Since no one ever taught her in the village school. It reminds me of Arvind Adiga's book, White Tiger, which I read a few years back, which, which had won the Man Booker Award. And he said that the maximum, the brightest in a village can even dream of being is a driver.
That is the brightest, you know, the brightest guy in the village will become a driver and he cannot dream, he cannot think of being any. At the cost of most of the people in the audience not agreeing with me. I will look at this question topsy turvy, not knowledge society, but a society which we define as an illiterate and an uneducated society, to my mind, contributes more to the development of the environment, produces more energies to sustain institutions, and what the knowledge society has basically done is to destroy those initiatives. It is an illiterate population. The knowledge system which they have produced, which is essentially and intrinsically destructive. When we look at history in particular, we find, and that's because the historical concepts are gradually changing over a period of time. 17th century Europe, if you can visualize the society, thing was knowledge. This knowledge had no place for the other gender phase. It was in this period of time that we also have man making stupendous discoveries. For example, the conquest of the Everest. And I would like to underline here the word conquest. The conquest of nature or the conquest of the Everest. The domination of the seas. The conquest of the airspace. Man can divert and make the forces of nature work for the society that this man has developed. So when Hillary reached Everest, he said, we have conquered the Everest. It was extremely foolish for mankind to do this. You cannot think of conquering nature. You cannot conquer the mountains, you cannot conquer nature, and neither can you conquer the seas. But in the West, the science that was then developing in the 18th and the 19th century believed that everything in this world falls for this man to enjoy and to conquer. Therefore, at a certain point of time, people have to rethink. People have to raise questions. For example, when the tsunami came, the tsunami caused huge devastation, loss of life, not only in India, but also in Sri Lanka and the islands that comprise Indonesia. But the people of the Andaman and Nicobar, the tribal groups residing in Andaman and Nicobar, with no education at all, with half their body being covered, this was that this area comprising India and South Asia could not even be seen properly because of the smoke cover. So they said, you start following practices that will save the world. Don't point at us. And the Goma Times brought out an entire issue in which they calculated how much of the resources was eaten up. But for those who cannot afford, say, a bisteri, or cannot afford grain that they caught was naturally theirs. With their eating habits, with what they produce, 
Yes. So sometimes it's also often said कि शिक्षा बढ़िया है या निरक्षर रहना ही बेहतर है। Many of the seminars this question has come up. So with these few words, I congratulate the team. Because you need any number of such books, any number of such seminars. If you look at the River Ganga from where we teach, Patna University, it's a horrifying sight. There's absolutely no water. Once upon a time, I think the 7th century AD it had happened because Hugh and Sam, the Chinese traveler, also mentions the party put her. He could not see the water of the country. Reason, as well as it has intuition. Most of the time, we do not use our wisdom, either we are incapable of it, or because of so much pressure of work that we restrict ourselves to information knowledge only. Then. Knowledge society has got many negative dimensions also. In 2008, there was huge financial crisis in America. And America is said to be having top most universities of the world, where there are thousands of economists, financial experts, but they could not prevent this crisis and they could not resolve it. India did not have that crisis. Because we had our regulatory system, Reserve Bank of India. So, what is there in the West may not be the West. Though it is said East is East and West is West. And there is focus on catching up development with the West. Most of the developing countries think that we should go on the path of Western countries. There was industrialization in the West, so we should also go for that. So India is not fit for industrialization in the real sense. It has been a agrarian country and most of villagers, but its productivity has been reduced. And the culture is contributing only 14 to 15 percent to GDP. On the one hand, we have got 65 percent of population dependent on agriculture, and on the other hand, the culture is contributing very little. So much disguised employment. Then there were many experts from the West. One Nobel Prize winner. Gunnar Middle, he wrote famous book, Asian Drama. When I was a student, I was thinking it is a drama. But later when I read it, I found it is a science book. And he has said that Asian countries like India, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, etc. Globalization has been actually global marketization from one country to other country. And Marshall McLuhan, he wrote a book called Understanding India, and there he showed that the entire distance has shrinked. You can reach very fast. Your food is coming after processing from a different country. <coughs> Bangladeshi cotton is sold in America, though at a very cheaper price. But so much Bangladeshi dependent on stores that it allows clothes at cheaper rates. Here, people are seen as objects of development. 
not subjects of the group. And because of this market dominance, there is jobless growth. Dr. Sushi Bilu, where is Sevanan? This is Dr. Raymond, Dr. Aslam Pavis, Ms. Bruno Ravi, Sister M. Stuti, Mrs. Jyota Das. Thank you, sir. I would now like to invite Mr. Victor Mills to propose the vote of, vote of thanks. A successful one. I sincerely express my thanks to our chief guest, Dr. Subhash Sharma, Development Commissioner, Government of Bihar, for taking time out of his very important schedule and pressing the occasion. I also express my gratitude to our discussant and guest of honor, Professor Daisy Narayan, postgraduate Department of History, Patna University, for her deliberation and critique. I would like to thank our special guest, Dr. Anita Ambers, Associate Professor, Department of Ophthalmology, Indira Gandhi Institute of Medical Sciences, Patna, for giving her opinion from the reader's point of view. I also take this opportunity to thank the member of the media for evincing interest in covering this event. Last but not the least, let me express my sincere thanks to the people who worked meticulously behind the scene. Thank you one and all. Thank you very much.